Okay, I think we can start. So welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the first of our special webinar series on the impact of the pandemic on women and girls in developing countries. This series aims to engage researchers, policymakers, and practitioners in a dialogue around the impacts that the pandemic and its associated economic crisis has on women in the global south. Despite musings in some circles about COVID-19 being that great equalizer, we already know that this is not true. As tough as we may be living with this crisis in a country like Canada, our experience may pale in comparison to how the crisis is playing itself out in regions of the world with higher poverty rates, weaker public health systems, and more densely populated urban centers. Lockdowns are simply not practical where no social safety nets exist. What's more, we also know from past pandemics, and this one in particular, that women and girls, along with other marginalized peoples, suffer disproportionately from the non-pharmaceutical interventions and the economic crisis. They disproportionately work in public-facing occupations, including frontline care work, and so are at heightened risk of either job loss or exposure to the virus. They disproportionately bear the burden of care of children, the sick, and, and the elderly. And with the crisis in lockdowns, we are seeing an alarming rise in the incidence of intimate partner violence. This first webinar today will do a deep dive into the impacts of the crisis on women in the labor market. And we are delighted to have a panel of four experts from four corners of the world to share with us their reflections, to highlight some research priorities, and to identify some potential policy solutions. The Women's Empowerment Lab at McGill is immensely grateful for the support and the very generous support of Canada's International Development Research Centre, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and also the partnership with McGill's Institute for the Study of International Development. While we are meeting virtually today, the series and the lab are hosted by McGill University, which is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we virtually meet today. Before introducing our panel, I would like to introduce the team. Professor Franck Grimard here at McGill, a uh, member also of Wed Lab, um, and Liva Rouhani, who has just recently joined the team, and she will be moderating the round table and the question and answer at the end of the panel today. And I'd also like to introduce Martha Meles from IDRC, and I will invite her to say a few words of welcome right now. Right. Thank you, and th th thank you, Sonia, and uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Martha Menles, and I lead IDRC's Employment and Growth Program, which houses the GROW Initiative, which stands for the Growth and Economic Opportunities for Women, which many of you may uh, be aware of the initiative. So GROW is a five-year action research program jointly funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and IDRC to find scalable solutions for advancing gender equality in the world of work. Working with partners in East Africa, the program focuses on three areas, addressing gender segregation of employment, reducing and redistributing unpaid care work, and unleashing women's uh, collective agency. We're pleased to partner with WebLab on this timely webinar series uh, for an in-depth discussion on the gender implications of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Global South. What we hope to do through this series is stimulate more nuanced and in-depth discussion on how COVID-19 is impacting women's lives and livelihoods in low and middle income countries and why gender matters in COVID response and economic rebuilding. We know that the coronavirus does not discriminate, but it affects women and men in different ways, as Sonia mentioned. In low and middle income countries, most women work in informal, low paid jobs, retail, hospitality, domestic service, smallholder farmers and the like, with limited job protections. In Africa, for example, that accounts for more than 74%. COVID-19 has disrupted the sectors, putting high numbers of women out of work. The Ebola crisis in West Africa showed us that women suffer greater economic losses in a pandemic and that their incomes take longer to return to normal. 
And like other pandemics before it, COVID-19 has brought to light entrenched gender inequalities and gender-based vulnerabilities. And there are real concerns that it could be a major setback in advances made to gender equality in the, and in the poverty reduction more broadly. So on the other hand, there is also, it has also brought a sense of resolute among many who, that we can build back better. And building back better requires building more gender inclusive. So data and evidence will play a critical role in this. So does the active participation of women in the solutions that affect their lives and lives. And the GROW program will play an important role. And I'll take a minute to also introduce my GROW team, Jemima Njuki, Lisa um, and Erin uh, here in Ottawa. Um, I look forward to hearing from our panelists on both the challenges faced by women in informal sector in low and middle income countries, and also opportunities they see in building back better. Without further ado, um, I give the floor back to Sonia. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, so just a quick mention for the audience. Um, the way we are going to proceed uh, for the remainder of the webinar is that each of the four panelists will have about 15 minutes to uh, make their presentations. After that, there will be a moderated uh, round table. And then at the end, we will open it up to the floor. Um, those of you who have questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And and uh, Leva will be um, will be moderating the Q and A from from there, and uh, and I think we are ready to go. Um, so um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Professor Ashwini Deshpande. Uh, Ashwini is a professor of economics at Ashoka University in India. Her PhD and early publications have been on international debt crisis of the 1980s. Subsequently, she has been working on the economics of discrimination and affirmative action with a focus on caste and gender in India. She has a very long CV of very interesting uh, research work, and uh, we are very much uh, thankful for you to join us, and uh, please, the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, you know, obviously a topic very close to my heart and a very uh, uh, important topic, uh, but I'm going to today focus mainly on the impact of the pandemic on uh, gendered labor market outcomes, uh, some of the early evidence from India, and uh, we'll give you a sneak peek into some new research uh, that I'm doing. Um, so. Basically, you know, I was trying to look at the data on employment and unemployment rates in India a little before the pandemic. Now, the problem uh, uh, is that most of the publicly available data sets uh, are not, you know, the, the rounds are very old. So there's, there's only one data source right now that allows us to track the unemployment and unemployment rate in India. And I tracked it from January 2016 to April of uh, 2020. And you can see the four uh, lines here. There's urban and uh, employment rate, urban unemployment, rural employment, and rural unemployment. And between, in the last four years, basically what you see is that the lines are pretty flat. So there is some seasonal monthly up and down. This is monthly data. But more or less, until the pandemic hit, uh, the employment rates and the unemployment rates were pretty constant. Now, that's a matter of another worry, but we are not going into that right now. The reason for showing you this, this graph is to point out that the current rise in unemployment that we are seeing in India, or the current drop in people who report themselves to be employed, is entirely due to the pandemic. So it's not some seasonal pattern repeating itself. And that should not be surprising, because India has had a lockdown, which is amongst the most stringent in the world. Uh, already by the 22nd of March, the stringency index of the Indian lockdown had reached 100, which is the maximum lockdown that you can possibly have. And India is, is, is 
is uh, you know has rich and poor pockets but by and large it's it's a poorer country it's a developing country it has a very high density of population it has a very large informal sector so a 100% stringent, stringent lockdown hit hit the economy really badly and you can see the effect of that in the early numbers on employment and unemployment now when we look at try to decompose this by the gendered outcome in employment and unemployment there is a, a caveat that we need to keep in mind which is the following so let's read the bottom part of the screen first globally there are early estimates coming in which show that women are more likely to lose jobs than men and this is in absolute numbers so a recent city bank study which came out last week showed that of the they've made an estimate that about 44 million individuals are likely to lose jobs early on in during the lockdown globally and of these 44 million 31 million are expected to be women in other words in absolute numbers women are more likely to lose jobs than men globally speaking and this of course will have devastating impacts on the gdps of nations now when you try to imagine you know so this is what this report is what's le led me to think and start looking at the indian data that was available uh i realize that the context in which we examine these issues in india is slightly different and we have to remind ourselves of that what is the context the context is that female labor force participation in rates in india have been stubbornly and persistently low and have actually been declining in the last 15 years now whether this is because women are withdrawing from work or is it because there isn't enough work available of the kind that women can do is a big debate in this literature and we can get into that in the q and a i'm not going into that right now but i do have views about which of the which of these two is is more uh, valid regardless of what the reasons are the fact is that in the recorded labor force participation rates there already are very large gender gaps so female labor force participation rates are low and have declined so over time over the last 15 years you see um and the gap in labor force participation rate increasing all right so if you compare the absolute numbers of people who lose who were employed before the pandemic hit and the absolute numbers of people who lost jobs in both of these men you know there are higher numbers of men than women so the graph that i showed you earlier if i made that for men and women separately which i have done you will see that it's absolute num more men were employed before the pandemic and more men lost employment and fewer women were employed and fewer women lost employment so when you want to look at the gendered gaps comparing absolute numbers in india is not is not going to reveal the gender differences so one of the ways in which we can do that and in india the other dimension of um uh, difference is rural urban rural and urban sectors so i've done this separately for rural and urban so one of the ways in which you can compare when you can examine the gender gaps the gender defects of the pandemic is we can look at the male female share in employment the average share in the one year preceding the pandemic so if you look at the numbers of men employed between march 2019 to march 2020 uh take the average of that okay and then look at the numbers of men employed in april 2020 which is lower because of the pandemic okay and so you can calculate the fall in employment so you can then compare the share in employment in the previous year and the share in the fall in employment and you can do it separately for men and women and you can do, do it separately for rural and urban and so what does that picture reveal so if you look at the graph on the left hand side and focus on the male rural okay you see that men made up 88.7% of employment in rural areas over the previous year okay but they were they comprised of 80 their, their share in the fall was 83% so their share in the fall was lower than their share in employment but if you look at the same picture for women you see that for women the share in total employment is lower but the share in the fall is higher so relative to their early levels of employment women are going are more 
have suffered greater job, job losses. Right. So when we look at the fall um, uh, of employment in India, we have to look at the relative shares. I have done a more rigorous analysis of this. I've looked at a panel of individuals before and after the pandemic and controlling for a whole uh, range of factors. We find that men are more likely to be employed in the post pandemic situation than women, even though both have suffered a loss in employment. So there is very clearly a gendered aspect in employment and unemployment as a result of the pandemic. Now let's come to the question of frontline workers. And this was mentioned earlier in the introduction. Now here again, there's a little bit of a difference um, that India has perhaps vis-a-vis -vis uh, vis -vis other countries, which is that there's a huge force of female workers who are called ASHA workers. ASHA means hope. Uh, that's the acronym, but it stands for accredited social health activists. And this force is exclusively female. So these are jobs exclusively given to women. These are government jobs. And so you would think, well, that's really great because this is one area uh, where jobs are not going to go down and it's exclusively reserved for women. And these are literally the, the link between individual households and the health system. So these ASHA workers go around uh, dispense, you know, giving medical advice to households, uh, campaigning, collecting data, etc. And every time a new disease hits the scene, whether it was dengue earlier or, or tuberculosis or whatever it is, uh, they are put on the front lines to collect information about the disease and to give information to households about combating the disease. And today there are 900,000 ASHA workers designated exclusively for COVID-19 management. So you would say, well, these women are not going to lose their jobs because they are, they are, they are the critical link in the, in the COVID combat strategy. Well, uh, that is correct that they are not going to lose their jobs. But first of all, they have been given minimal gear. So there's a huge shortage of PPE. So they're going around households, house to house, con conducting their campaigns with very little PPE. Uh, so therefore, they're at a heightened risk of infection. Often they're on the field for days on stretch and India right now is going through an excruciating heat wave, especially in North of India, where I live. And so in that very exacting situation, they're out on the field collecting a data. Uh, they are separated from their families. There's anxiety to their families. There's anxiety to themselves. And because COVID-19 is stigmatized, these women are at a heightened risk of social ostracism, isolation, and they've actually been assaulted, either they themselves or their families, because they are associated with COVID combat work. And but these women are the key, uh, uh, you know, key workforce that is doing contact tracing, that is dispensing advice, that is doing a survey of, you know, on behalf of the government to collect data on COVID. So they are they are absolutely uh, essential in the in in the in the pandemic containment strategy. But they are extremely poorly paid, and they have they have recently been re-raising re their demand for better pay, but we'll see where that is. So on the one hand, women are at relative greater risk of losing jobs. On the other hand, where, they, where their jobs are guaranteed, this is the kind of job that is actually guaranteed. What about the gendered nature of COVID itself? Now, the thing is that at an all India level, the government is not collecting data on COVID, inc of, on COVID incidents separately for men and women, or if it is collecting, it's not releasing it. And several countries, in fact, are not collecting gender disaggregated data, which is not a good idea, in my opinion. But uh, there are some states in India that have, you know, that have uh, released that data. And um, we find that male cases are higher than female, but this could be an artifact of anything. You know, it could be genuinely the, uh, the case, it could be the fact that women are getting tested less. Anything could be going on here. In any case, the point being that the data are inadequate. So we don't really know um, what the gender nature of COVID is in, in India. But we do know what the gender nature of the lockdown is. So I talked about the employment earlier. The other very important gendered component is the uh, adverse impact on reproductive health. So one is there's lack of access to contraception because of very strong lockdown rules. Abortion clinics, many of them are not working. And so there's going to be, there are un unwanted pregnancies. There are un, uh, you know, uh, undesirable uh, pregnancies in, in going on right now. The other thing that, that suffered a lot is newborn healthcare. 
vaccination. So for example, in, on, in several diseases like polio, India had almost reached uh, a stage where it had eradicated polio. But there, is, there are reports now that many children are going to miss their polio vaccines, which is literally going to cripple a generation of children and young, young adults, which is going to put adverse impacts on their families, which the mothers will have to do uh, to deal with. Um, care and domestic chores, you know, one can go on, one can have an entire seminar just on this. It's a story everywhere, which is highly gendered, the division of labor. And uh, the fact that uh, the lockdown has, you know, made the women, both men and women stay at home has had more, you know, has affected women more adversely than men. And that's the story in India, just as it is everywhere else. The other thing is the supply chain disruption. So in many parts, especially the zones that have been cl classified as red zones, where the COVID incidence is high, there are uh, instances of basic essential commodities being in short supply. And again, because women are managing more of the housework, it puts a much greater stress on the women to manage under conditions of, uh, uh, under, under conditions of scarcity. School closures. Now we have, you know, there's evidence from earlier, uh, earlier pandemics uh, that school, school closures always affect mothers more. Recently, last week, there was an article in the New York Times where in addition to all other gender division of labor, there was a question of homeschooling. And 46% uh, of women, men said that they help, that they were the primary uh, parent responsible for homeschooling. Only 3% of the women agreed with that assessment. So men overstayed their contribution to housework, including uh, for homeschooling. Uh, you know, academic, professional workers, there are there's just a story in The Guardian yesterday or today about how more papers are being produced by male academics and female academics during the lockdown, etc. The, the broader picture that I'm trying to present, and this is, in, India is not unique in this, many, many, many countries have the same feature, which is that when women have less decision-making power than men, either in households or in government, their needs are less likely to be made salient and their needs are less likely to be met. And I think that's an important point we need to remember. The shadow pandemic is as real in India as it is anywhere else. Again, the data are not uh, very good, but whatever they are, we find that there is an increase in domestic violence. Now, why does all this matter? It matters because we are in this for the long haul. You know, this is not going to go away anywhere soon. Women's lives cannot be put on hold till the pandemic is over. We can't say for two years, it doesn't matter. Let the very hard earned gains in gender equality, let them be reversed, it doesn't matter because women have fought for years to reach the level of equality that we have and we can't roll back everything in two years because there's a pandemic. The second important thing to remember is that being gender blind, which is what we'll be if you're not, if you don't have enough data, if you don't pay attention to the gender angle, doesn't mean that the policy is gender neutral. For example, school closures, right? It seems like a gender blind policy, but it is not a gender neutral policy. So if we want to take into account the gendered impacts, we cannot have gendered blind policies and ignoring gender, gender dimension is going to slow down the fight against COVID, right? Uh, second, second, third, whatever point is that flattening the pandemic curve cannot be at the expense of the shadow pandemic curve. And this point has been made repeatedly by many people, but it can't be emphasized enough. So I'm emphasizing it again. But the most important point is that the starting point of developing the appropriate policy response is that we need gender disaggregated data on work, on labor, on employment, on the disease incidents, on frontline workers, on a whole broad range of statistics. Only then will, be, will we be able to uh, uh, develop good, correct, tailored responses that hit the bullseye right where it, they need to hit. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ashwini. That was uh, very interesting. And, and in fact, yes, uh, we will actually be holding um, seminars on the care economy and also on uh, intimate partner violence and many of the other issues. Because as you mentioned, these are global phenomena that need, uh, that need full, full attention. I'd like to now introduce our, our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Mary and Jerry Kenyon-Jui.
Dr. Marian Jerry King and Joy is former senior research fellow at the Institute for Development Studies, um, University of Nairobi, Kenya. She has carried out many research projects in her country. She has started her research by studying the location, structure, role, and linkages of large, medium, and small enterprises in the central region of Kenya um, during her studies. And as a career researcher at the Institute for Development Studies, she has carried research geared to informing policy on entrepreneurship barriers to entrepreneurship, growth, gender relations, and micro and small enterprises, innovation, enterprise clustering, and value chains in small enterprise. Mary, we leave the floor to you. Thank you so much. Mary? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the floor is yours. I'll begin by saying that I'm very happy to participate in this webinar to speak about gender and labor markets in the global south. Uh, my topic today is, is limited because the data available is limited and what I'm trying to do is to address the issue of labor markets from a broad perspective. I'll start by saying that labor markets in the South are divided into two. There is the neoliberal labor market and the non-neoliberal labor market. The neoliberal labor market in, in, in Africa has about 20% of employment. And in Kenya, we have 880 women who are employed in the neoliberal labor market, while men, we have 1,000,000.68 male workers. And the reason I call it neoliberal labor market is people who are working in farms and corporations, people who are working in banking, manufacturing, plantations, flower farms, government services, tourism, hospitality, and the digital economy. COVID-19 has struck when already there are gender inequalities in the distribution of workers in this neoliberal labor market. And this neoliberal labor market was introduced during the colonial period and was entrenched during the structural adjustment period. Women and men working in tourism and hospitality industry have been the most hit because the hotels, which rely a lot on tourism, have been closed. So you find that with the closure of hotels, many men and women have been put on unpaid leave or they have, their salaries have lowered. As of today, government, people working in government services have not been put on unpaid leave. They are still working and they are still getting their pay. But people working in flower farms, and most women work in flower farms, have lost their jobs because there are no more flower, flowers being exported to Britain and the European Union. Banking, in the banking industry, the, 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 the banks are still working, but you find that the banks have been on, on an ongoing process of reducing their labor due to digitization. So with the pandemic and more movement to mobile banking, you find that job losses will be experienced. In manufacturing farms and other corporations, women working in, um, in export processing zones due to reduced demands are also likely to lose their jobs. So you find that the women in the, in, the, in the neoliberal labor markets are also losing jobs just like the men.
In the non nearly labor market, we have self-reliant individuals who work for themselves. According to the ILO report of 2018, 85.8% of employment in Africa is, form, is, is in the informal economy and, and, agricultural, and, and agricultural activities. 89.7% of employed women are in the informal economy in Africa. And in sub-Saharan Africa, that is countries below the Sahara, the figure goes high to 90% of women in, in, in this kind of economy. And in the informal economy, the next, one of the problems is that it's, it's, it is the lack of statistics to actually account for how many job losses are there. But you find that job losses are being experienced differently. For example, traders who are trading in food, they are less likely to have job losses, but those who are making garments are more likely to have job losses. Street traders, because of the reduced people coming to the city, are also likely to, to experience job losses. Then those in peasant activities, those growing food for their own subsistence, most of them will continue growing the food, but those who are working as coffee, in coffee and tea and pyrethrum, their jobs are likely to be affected because of the raw demand of, of tea. For example, already there have been indications that the demand for tea has gone down. Those in anti fishing and trade, like um, fishing for local consumption, again, because it's a food, there is a less likelihood that the job losses will be intense. But you also find that the movement between the rural and the urban has been restricted and it's only a few who are being given permission to travel to the city where most of the fish is consumed. Market traders, again, who trade in vegetables, in groceries, in cereals and all that. Due to lockdown, there is likely to to, there, is less, there is likely to be job losses experienced, but this will depend on the different trades. For example, those who, who make garments and school uniforms, there is likely to be a slowdown in, 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 in the number of workers because schools are closed. Those who make school boxes and school appliances are also likely to be to be affected because the schools are closed. Artisans and craft activities. The, the craft activities, especially those who are doing beadwork to serve the tourist market have been worst hit. For example, women bead makers who sell, you know, their wares to tourists outside hotels or in markets, Tourists are no longer coming to these places. Therefore, job losses are likely to be affected. I have in mind Karyoko, where a lot of beadwork is done. And in this market, there is a whole likelihood that most people are not are likely to, to lose job. Then in livestock keeping, livestock keeping, meat, most of it goes to meat, it's for meat. And again, due to lockdown, meat and milk production is likely to lower. But because milk is a basic commodity, you find that people will continue trading in, 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 in these goods. Therefore, there is not one uniform, uniform effect on the way the informal labor markets are being, the neoliberal labor markets are being affected. And one thing we also note that 
is the self-determination, the self-reliance of these individuals who are working in the labor market. They are, less, they are unlikely to say die. They are unlikely to give up. So they will continue moving on and, 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 and working in this labor market in spite of everything. And most of the people have been saying, because we live every day, why should we be locked down? And most of them are still going on with their work. So when I look at COVID-19 and everything that is being said, I think COVID-19 is a moment where we need to think seriously about the neoliberal labor markets. We know even in Europe and North America, many people have not been able to keep their jobs in the neoliberal labor market. And we need to think about this three decade old mode of economy and rethink how do we restructure it so that we are not just talking about percentages, we are talking about changing fundamentals of extraction and conscription that are characterized in the neoliberal market. And as I said at the beginning, 20% of, of, of Africa is the only one that has the that is employed in the neoliberal market. So it is high time that we thought of mainstreaming the, 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 the non neoliberal market as the new normal in the economy. And we think we think of how we can support this neoliberal non neoliberal market because when we look at, at, farm, at peasant farmers trading in coffee, tea, and all that, we see how they are exploited by the cooperatives. We see how they are exploited by, by the brokers. We see how they are exploited by everything. We need to address these issues from a justice perspective. How much does a bar of chocolate consumed from Walmart get to the to the cocoa farmer in Ghana. Those are the fundamentals that we need to look at from a justice point of view. And we need also to understand the logic, norms, values governing the non neoliberal economy. We need to think, do they go there to create empires? What norms drive them? What values do they have in this, in their engagement in the neoliberal economy? It is easy to say that they don't have social protection. It is easy to say they don't save. But these people are not on a livelihood book rehearsal. They have mechanisms that they use to save. They have mechanisms that they use to carry out to, 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 to do their things and all that. So in this case, we need to understand the institutions, the socioeconomic, political, such as the financial institutions. Like in East Africa, we need to understand the Chama. In West Africa, we need to understand the Susu, the Osusu, the Stockwell, the Tontentines, and all that. And see how this thing that we have def always defined as the abnormal during the non-pandemic days, how can we define it as the new normal? We also need to recognize the informal economy organization and activism. How does do the Makola market traders organize? What are their goals? What do they activate for? So in what I'm saying is that the, the, the pandemic needs to shape to reshape our thinking into rethinking about what we think as abnormal during the non-pandemic day. We need to help them come up with databases. Databases in the sense that this will help them know where they'll be trained and all that. 
Then finally, we need to understand their laws and regulations. Plan our cities as if they, we have traders, artisans, and persons in mind. The pandemic should create an awareness that traders, persons, and artisans are a feature of the African city, which we cannot do out with this. And building designers, architects, need to come up with buildings that will cater for them. Because as we know, the pandemic has shaken the fundamentals of, 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 of the neoliberal economy, and we need to see the turnaround in the informal economy as being shown by this video, which, which I'll ask um, Sonia to show briefly. In these uncertain times of COVID-19 pandemic, it appears that many Kenyans have been forced to think outside the box in order to make ends meet. This is Ridgeways along the northern bypass in Kembu County. And talk of desperate times calling for desperate measures. Now, this is a perfect example. And the traders here tell me that this is their COVID hustle. <laughs> Sasa vile ni kazi ya taxi ni haribika na tena hiyo uoga unaona sasa wale watu unakutana nayo unaenda airport nini nini maana hakuna haja uende huko fadhali kuja hapa ushida hapa unakutana na mtu mmoja unauza train zako mbili ugaya jioni inapatikana kwa kiendesha gari ya shule pale Riri corona ilipokuja shule zikafungwa shule zilipofungwa sasa ikawa hakuna mingine ni kukaa nyumbani ndio nikakutana na mama yangu Interesting to note is that about two months ago, this area had about three traders only selling fresh produce. But with the pandemic, the number of traders who have converted their cars into groceries is growing by the day. For instance, on this particular Sunday, there were over 50 vehicles turned groceries, so to speak. Meet Joseph Kimani. This for him is a new normal. He used to be a club DJ before the pandemic. But when the club shut its doors... In my business, I have a side hustle. I at least to have a family. I have a family with a cafe. Lakini lazima watu wakule unaona sasa niko na nini hiyo yenye itakuwa commodity inatumika kwa kila siku nikaona nichukue mboga kwa rais so nimekuwa nikiuza mboga hapa kwa miezi miwili baada ya nyumbani ukiongojea serikali kuja kusaidie kuna mahali unaweza enda usimwegeze gari lako just next to Joseph Kimani, Mary Karemi is also learning something new. Beleni nilikuwa na shule ya hairdressing, lakini vile shule zimefungwa because of COVID, now we are here hustling. In fact, tunaita COVID hustle. It's not that this is what they do daily. Our two wana kazizao zime stop, so that's why they are here. At least into a pateriziki yake ya siku. Speaking with the traders here, it seems that many have realized that food insecurity in the urban areas is becoming serious and requires urgent intervention. And now with the cessation of movement and curfew that has affected the flow of foodstuffs in the city, these resilient traders are definitely in what one may call essential business or let's just say essential services. Indeed, when the music changes, so does the dance. For Charms, my name is Elijah Mwangi.
Did you want to, uh, yeah, was that, was that it? Did you want to say a few concluding words? Okay, thank you so much. Um, very interesting. Uh, one of the things that resonated uh, quite strongly in your, your presentation is uh, really the need to, to restructure, um, you know, the labor market in particular to find some very innovative ways to, to rethink the, the workplace and also to address some of the structural issues um, that, uh, uh, that we see um, very pronounced uh, in this particular crisis. Um, so thank you. Um, I'd like to now introduce Laura Alfers, uh, who's the Director of Social Protection Program at uh, WIGO, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organization. Um, she has worked there since 2009 in the Social Protection Program and has been appointed the Program Director in 2017. During her time at WIGO, Laura has been involved with projects investigating occupational health and safety in informal workplaces, informal workers' access to health care, and the links between childcare and formal work and women's economic empowerment. So, Laura, the uh, virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Sonia. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about based on um, WeGo's rapid assessment. So um, it's uh, where we interviewed 21 um, national and local membership-based organizations in the informal economy, as well as five regional and global networks across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, um, and mainly in female-dominated sectors of the informal economy, domestic workers, home-based workers, and, and street vendors. Um, so this presentation will be at a bit of a, a more sort of global and, and sort of high level um, perspective on, on what we've seen happening in the informal economy. Uh, just to give some data on the informal economy before we start, um, over 61% of the world's workers are informal, according to the latest ILO statistics. <coughs> There's high levels of self-employment in the informal economy as well, and that's particularly in low-income countries where you find over 70% of employment is self-employment. Um, so we, we, you know, that means that when we're thinking about policy solutions, we can't be thinking of solutions that fit labor markets, which is dominated by employment relationships. Um, in low-income countries as well, we find women are disproportionately concentrated in the informal economy. Um, and, and so there is that sort of gendered segmentation that happens. I think it's also important to point out that even within the informal economy, um, there is gendered segmentation. This is quite a well-known triangle. Um, but again, I think it's important for us to realize that within the informal economy, women tend to be concentrated disproportionately in the forms of employment and the types of work, uh, which make them more vulnerable to poverty. They have less savings. Um, they're the ones when there's a shock, such as COVID-19, are the ones who are most likely to be falling into poverty or worse forms. Um, of poverty. It's also important, I think, to understand that the sources of women's economic disadvantage in the informal economy are, are multiple and intersecting. And again, this is important um, because COVID-19 is impacting on women through all of these pathways. Um, and so if we're thinking about policy solutions, we have to think about you know, in this kind of multi-dimensional way. So women are disadvantaged as workers, disproportionately concentrated in informal employment without labor and social protections and within informal employment in the most vulnerable forms of informal work. Um, as women facing wider gender discrimination, patriarchal norms, violence and harassment, um, shouldering and, you know, the majority of unpaid care work, uh, all of which impacts negatively on earnings. <coughs> And thirdly, when we're talking about the urban informal workers uh, communities, and as, as Mary sort of pointed out in her last discussion, we actually have to understand informal workers as members of marginalized urban communities as well, uh, with very poor access to basic infrastructure and services, and who, unlike informal workers perhaps in rural areas, face high levels of discrimination, um, particularly from the local state, and that has significant impacts um, on earnings. So just with that background in mind, um, 
so from WeGo's rapid assessment, now I have to say that we ran this uh, in late March and early April, and already, you know, things are shifting. Um, there's, there's need for new research. Um, but we did find some general sort of trends um, across the sectors who, uh, that we interviewed that are worth, I think, still worth pointing out. Um, one of the impacts was obviously the inability to access markets. Um, so particularly where movement was barred, small farmers not being able to get to the street vendors to sell food products. Um, especially informal workers who work in public spaces, shoe shiners, um, vendors of goods that were declared not essential. Uh, you know, there were heavy restrictions on, on whether they were going to be allowed to operate in space. A decreased demand for services and products. Um, and I think, as Mary also pointed out, um, you know, women home based workers making beads, suddenly the tourism market dries up. We heard the same story for all over Asia, in fact, um, that the drop in tourism has just decreased demand for products. Um, domestic workers' demand for their services has dropped. Um, you know, people in their homes not wanting to bring other people in because of the fear of infection, but also because a lot of employers have also lost their own employment um, and, are not, and are not able to, to afford to have the extra help um, in the home. One thing that was really interesting um, was that many groups of informal workers had actually been classed as essential workers. Um, and I think that that's interesting because you know, often the informal economy is portrayed as a sort of non-productive um, uh, sideshow to the real economy. Uh, yet in many places, uh, particularly around, you know, the provision of food and waste management, we saw informal workers being classed as essential workers. But what they were finding we're dealing with was the increasing costs of inputs in terms of being able to carry on operating. So um, one really interesting example from Peru, newspaper vendors were allowed to continue um, selling, but we're finding that the costs of operating were becoming really expensive because they weren't allowed just to sell from their roadside stall, they had to sell their newspapers door to door. And in order to sell the newspapers door to door, they had to find transport. And because of the restrictions on public transport, it meant that they were having to find private transport. Um, so that was an additional cost, which hadn't existed before. And then a lot of expensive equipment. Um, so even though these workers have been declared uh, essential workers, um, they are having to, to finance their own masks, their own gloves, <coughs> their own uh, water and sanitation, their own access to sanitizers. Um, and so that's, again, uh, the additional cost. Essential workers, we also found dealing with increased care burdens, particularly where, so in places like Ghana, for example, um, economic activity has now been allowed, uh, but schools are still closed. And, and obviously, it's women workers in particular who are then having to, to do the juggle between looking after the children um, and, and, you know, um, engaging in, in their paid activities. We've, you know, we've heard stories of women just having to take their children to work with them. Um, and we know how that can also decrease uh, productivity. And often it's not, not safe or ideal for the children to be in those, in those places either. Um, and I think what we've seen in the last few weeks is a stigmatization of informal workers as spreaders of disease. So this first came out um, talking to domestic workers um, who were being, you know, who were being let go because they were seen as potential vectors of the disease um, between communities, particularly domestic workers who have multiple employers. Um, but now uh, we're starting to see it among street traders as well. So in Peru, the WeGo's team in Peru have had to launch, tried to launch a, a big media campaign to try and um, fight against what is becoming a common idea that actually street vendors are behind the spread of the disease. Um, and so we're starting to see, you know, um, this idea that informal workers are, are one of the the spreaders, uh, groups of the spreaders, and that kind of fits into a narrative that has long existed about the informal, informal economy and informal workers as spreaders of crime and grime. 
And I think what also came out very strongly from this rapid assessment was that many, and I think the point has been made um, by the previous two presentations, that many of these impacts are going to be long-term, particularly in badly hit sectors, uh, tourism, domestic work. So while many of the policy responses that we are seeing now are sort of short-term emergency responses, six months, three months, um, income replacement or income support measures, uh, really what we need to be doing now is starting to think in the medium and long term about how we we support um, uh, the workers in these in these sectors who have been so badly hit. I think it's also just from a sort of very sort of high level perspective also important to understand that the informal economy is very heterogeneous. Um, very often we sort of hear you know there's the formal economy, um, and then there's this thing called the informal sector, and here are our policies for the formal economy, and then we'll do something for the informal sector. But the informal sector is itself very, very different. There's many different types of occupations. Uh, informal workers are involved in many different types of production and supply and distribution chains. Um, and I think that 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 heterogeneity is also going to have an impact on how we think about policy responses. So I wanted to just highlight a few of the variables we saw that affected the impact um, on different groups of informal workers. So obviously one is the stringency of the lockdown regulations, you know, where people having to deal with hard versus soft lockdowns. And I think another thing affecting the policy response is that we're going to be seeing waves of lockdowns um, in future. Are there school closures? That is going to obviously impact on care work. Um, the type of work and sector, um, you know, is it domestic work versus street trading? Uh, those are two sort of, you know, people are involved in very different economic relationships here. Um, food services in many places of the world continued to be allowed to operate, but those uh, who are part of tourism value chains were obviously um, not operating. What are the linkages to the formal economy? How are the informal workers linked up to the formal economy? I think that those relationships will also be important. If we're thinking about policy responses, macroeconomic recovery packages, which support the formal economy, those informal workers who are most linked into the formal economy might benefit from those. But the informal workers who are further away from the formal economy might need special measures um, aimed particularly at, at those workers and where the workers are in global versus local supply chains. You know, we saw a lot of home workers in global supply chains were impacted by the crisis long before COVID had ever come to South Asia. Um, home workers in global supply chains had had their orders cut um, from Europe already. Place of work is another variable. You know, are you working in your own home or working in public space? Um, you know, it's, Maybe easier to continue working if it's in your own home, but if you're a shoe shiner working in public space and there's a hard lockdown, um, that you know it's it's harder for you to work. I also think the size and shape of the informal economy in which workers are embedded um, has been important. So, in a place like West Africa, for example, most so much of food retail and food distribution is done through the informal economy that it was very easy for those workers to be seen as essential workers and to continue to be able to operate. Whereas in a place like South Africa, which has a very small informal economy and a very large uh, formal food retail network, it was a huge battle. I mean, it was a battle that was won, but it was a huge battle for informal food traders to be, uh, to be classed as essential, essential workers. And then I think the rate of community transmission of C19 is something that we're going to be seeing in the future. Uh, we're, you know, we're still to see in many of these sort of places in the world, we're still to see the worst impacts of, of ill health and what it's going to do to people's incomes. Um, and for women, I think the impact on incomes is also going to be linked to care burdens and, and what ill health does to that. Um, so I'm going to, I think I'll leave it there. I do have some comments on, on policy responses, but I think I'll leave that to the, the round table and, and stop, stop here. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, very interesting. I think uh, some of the things that that's uh, really stuck out for me is is again this uh, this this notion that that you know comes cuts across about the stigmatization of of uh, women who are working in the informal sector as spreaders of disease, and also uh, the fact that informal workers are now seeing an increase in the costs associated to conducting business, um, which uh, which is also I think going to have its own repercussions. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to introduce our panelist, uh, Lorena Alcazar, who is a senior researcher at uh, GRADE in Lima, Peru, the group for uh, the analysis of development. She holds a BA in economics from the Universidad de Pacifico, a master's in, in economics from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and uh, she's been a research director and, and senior researcher at GRADE uh, for quite some time now. And um, was a member of the steering committee of Grupo Sofia, network of women social science professionals and the steering committee of Southern Voice. Um, so uh, Lorena, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Sonia. And thanks for the opportunity to participate in discussing this important issue with this uh, great panel. Um, uh, being the last, I, I do have the disadvantage of, of uh, what most of what I was I'm planning to say has already been said because I, uh, one main uh, thing that we can conclude from this is the issues that are very similar all around the world. I am um, I don't have research on this as as, as we all are in, in the process of starting to do research in these issues, but we can reflect on on the conditions of women in, in the labor market and of women in general in our countries. I am uh, going to look particularly at Peru and Latin America, but I'm trying to, to consider the issues uh, more globally. Uh, as we know, the, the pandemic, um, and particularly more than the pandemic itself, the policies implemented to, to fight it in like social distance and strict lo lockdowns all around the world are, uh, have sent millions of workers home, um, in many cases without any income, and in, 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 uh, with a large percentage of, of women among them. Um, and I wanted to, to call the attention of uh, uh, how, this, how we have these victims of the virus, the ones that are infected and, and, and in worse scenarios, uh, uh, death from the virus. But then we have these other victims, the people uh, that are suffering from, from lost in their incomes and in, in worse conditions, from hunger, from malnutrition and other health problems that are not attended during lockdowns. These other victims are um, particularly the traditionally most vulnerable groups, uh, including workers in informal markets and survival economy, small and micro entrepreneurs, the poor, and, and within these groups, women, indigenous, migrants, elderly, abandoned elderly, et cetera. Uh, and with, with this, in this context, we, one thing that should worry uh, uh, also is uh, that um, women are going to be, as we have been uh, uh, hearing from the other panelists, is that women are going to be uh, strongly affected by the crisis and relatively uh, more affected than men in many, in, in many dimensions. And in uh, income and employment, uh, we may expect that gender gaps are going to increase. And this is an issue that should um, worry us and gives us also the opportunity to build back better uh, implementing policies that are more inclusive for women. Peru uh, and Latin America is being hit hard by the pandemic. Uh, Brazil and Peru are among the unfortunate top 20 countries in, uh, of the world in terms of numbers of cases of infections and death. And this is the disease is probably worse today because we are still uh, going up in terms of, uh, of cases. Uh, I look at this uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, and most countries of the region, and again, Peru, uh, because uh, um, we have this, this uh, strong crisis here, we, we have a strict lock lockdown from uh, mid-March and at least until the end of June. So it's a really, really long lockdown and of course, the, the consequences of this lockdown in economic and social terms are going to be huge. 
Um, regarding women, we've, we've been discussing what are the channels that affect women, and, and this seems to be the case with, I guess, minor differences uh, uh, across countries. And the main channel uh, in terms of employment, particularly, is because uh, women are overrepresented in the sectors that are going to be hit harder by the, by the crisis. And um, uh, one main thing that was uh, already mentioned is that women are represented in the front line of the war against the virus. And in Latin America, for, uh, for example, nine out of 10 nursing professionals are women. So this is an, an issue in itself. But I'm going to go more to the, to the um, other sectors or other employment sectors. Women are overrepresented in, um, in, uh, in the informal economy worldwide and, and in Latin America and Peru. In Latin America and in Peru, it's all, not only that they are overrepresented, but they represent a larger percent than men in, in, in these sectors. But also in precarious jobs which are the, the ones that are more worrisome in this, in this uh, context. So we have more women in, um, in restaurants and tourism, entertainment, teaming, uh, domestic, uh, domestic workers, street vendors, all these sectors that are uh, on one side hit by the pandemic because of the lockdown characteristics, and on, on the other side, precari ten women tend to work precariously in informally and precariously in these in these sectors, um, in 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 Peru, women uh, in this in this uh, overrepresented in these precarious sectors, they they tend to work uh, in many cases part time, unstable. Uh, not uh, one month they work, and the other they may not, and they tend to earn uh, less than the minimum wage. And in, which is equivalent to less than ten dollars per day. So they they live into day day to day um, salaries or income is in, a, in in what we call substance uh, subsistence economy. And of, uh, during lockdown, they cannot work or they are not supposed to work. So they uh, are completely losing income because they they don't have social security. And in uh, even worse in Latin America, uh, this women working in this, uh, this type of jobs, more than 60% of them are poor and are not, are not uh, covered by any social assistance program. Uh, but not only during the problem is going to, uh, we are going to have this problem during lockdown. Uh, it is expected that once we start to reactivate the economy, which we have started in parallel to lockdown in Peru in some sectors, but it's going to take months at least, and, and the sectors where, where we are saying that women are overrepresented are going to be even more difficult to, to reactivate. So it's, we need to, to address the issues. Governments need to, to think in more inclusive um, mechanisms to, to help women and, and also to, to provide social assistance to the most vulnerable ones. Uh, First, estimates of, um, of the effects of lockdowns, uh, looking at, at, the, uh, at the data that we have from national households, for example, uh, show that in, in general, the effects during the lockdown are similar for men and women if we look at them at, uh, as a group, as a total group. But when we look at poor women and poor men, the effects are harder in women and, the, and we, we can already see that gender gaps are widening quite significantly. And we may expect that this will be the case if we look at the medium term because uh, of this um, more participation of women on sectors that are expected to take longer to reactivate. So we already, we already have some evidence that the gender gaps are going to widen significantly. Also, uh, it's in, uh, important to, to emphasize the, the situation of, the, of women um, in this uh, very precarious situations that we, we see as, 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 as we saw in the Kenya video and we, as, as we, saw, we were hearing from other cases, we see these precarious women in, in, in Peru in the news, for example, all, uh, every day uh, that police came to them because they are, not, they are not fulfilling the requirements of the lockdowns and, and they will tell you, I have three children, I'm the only income in the house, I need to work. And, and what is sad is that they are doing they are selling whatever they can in streets, but we have more sellers 
uh, than buyers. So it's not it's not the, the case that they are really getting income from this. It's just most uh, desperation. So it's it's really um, a, a matter of concern. And um, well, that's what's that's the the first mechanisms through which uh, we we can see that women are going to be uh, hit hard and relatively harder than men uh, because of lockdowns and, and the crisis. Uh, the situation is 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 a um, uh, the women's situation in labor markets previous to the pandemic is respond to, as in many other countries, to gender roles, to stereotypes, and, and many other uh, barriers that they face in the in the labor markets. And but um, it's also very much related, as as was has been said, to to childcare. Uh, being a a woman um, uh, by itself increases the probability of working precariously by 11% with respect to men. Uh, um, but, when, what this, but this percentage is much higher when we have women with children. And, and also being female, having a young child in the household in, uh, in com combined with other uh, characteristics as being poor and, and being indigenous, it gives a probability for a Peruvian woman of almost 100% of working precariously. Um, so it, this going back, going to this issue of, of childcare, which has been mentioned many times because it's really key here, uh, it's, it's clear that women are, are facing um, more work at home during lockdowns, but the, the problem is, 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 is going to take longer. Worldwide, women work uh, uh, two point half times uh, uh, much as than men, and in unpaid care and domestic work in Latin America, it is four times more. Um, and children are not attending school, so this is already a, a, a burden for women because they, they need to deal and, and to help them with distance education, whatever form this distance education take. But they they they. They, should, they are trying to help their children to learn while, while in lockdown. And in Peru, the, uh, we already know that children are at least not going to go back to school this school year, which finishes in December. So the next month are going to be really tough for women trying to reinsert in the labor market, market while children are still at home. And this is probably um, one, one, uh, another mechanism which may widen the gender gaps and the, that we have to, to, to pay attention. And last but not least, uh, domestic violence is also expected to increase and um, it's not only expected, but we already have some evidence from, from UN women, for example, and also in, in countries like Argentina, Colombia, and Peru, of a uh, very large, uh, uh, we already see very large increments in the number of calls to the emergency lines for, for women. And there is a lot of evidence that violence against women increases during crisis. And this is, of course, a main a big issue and problem, but it also has effects on, on job performance and, and, and employment markets for women. So um, I, I want to say a little bit about uh, what to do. Uh, we can come back to this during the panel, but let me say a couple of things. And, and although this, as, I, as I was mentioning, we have this opportunity to build back better and what that governance should particularly look at. Uh, unpaid care and domestic responsibilities and these issues of childcare are very difficult to address but, uh, and may take long, but we need, governments need to, to address them and helping women also with this crisis. And, and uh, it's going to be difficult because um, with, the, with the pandemic, we have to, to make sure that we don't uh, expand the, the, the virus, but some, uh, some forms of childcare provision should be in, implemented, maybe innovative ones. And um, I read in, in, uh, that in some countries, for example, uh, like banks of, of sharing time are, are being promoted by communities and government for, to support childcare, but, we, but governments can, also uh, increase their existing or improve their existing childcare programs. Uh, programs. And, but also um, 
Uh, we need to, to make sure that uh, the programs already been implemented in, 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 in countries in Peru, for example, we have already, the government has already announced a big program to provide help to small and micro enterprises and, 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 and others, uh, other programs providing loans and, and subsidies to pay salaries. But we need to make sure that these, these measures, uh, which a lot of money is being spent, really reach uh, the informal economy and, 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 and women, which women are also represented in micro enterprises. So we, we need to make sure that they reach them. It's, that's another important issue to, to try to, to help them in the, in the, in the next month. And, and provide a, start thinking in, in, in vocational and training programs and business um, technical support programs oriented for women and, and learn, learn from a, or already existing evidence that when we, we implement these programs, they, we really have to, to, we need to have a real gender perspective. Uh, if we wanna, uh, 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 if we really want to impact on women and to reduce gender gaps. Having a real gender perspective um, uh, implies uh, uh, providing childcare when we provide uh, training for women or, or help them or, and not, not uh, uh, keep with these uh, occupations for women which are normally less valued than occupations for men or men work in electricity and women work as uh, are trained for hairdressing we need to to avoid that so we need uh, we there is evidence that uh, i can talk more about this too but th there is evidence that we need to to put into practice when we help women uh, to reinsert in, in the economy in the coming months and, and years um, I guess I will stop here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Lorena, for giving us the perspective coming from, uh, from Peru and what you've observed there. Uh, just a few things that um, kind of are threading um, across the, the four uh, panels, or the four, the four, the four uh, perspectives, is first of all that these are very uh, common issues uh, around the world. I think one of the things that uh, really uh, struck me in um, what, uh, what you've said, which has also been echoed in some of the other panelists' talk, is of course that, you know, with governments trying to scramble to figure out how to implement policies, uh, there's this really strong need to not bring in gender blind policies. Um, and so I think that uh, is probably a good uh, launching pad for the round table. Um, we have uh, only about 12 minutes left in the webinar. So I will uh, hand over the mic now to or the virtual mic to, to Lava, who will uh, moderate the, the round table. Um, and again, the point here is to try to identify uh, research priorities and possible policy solutions. And then I do know that some of the questions are being answered on the, the Q&A, which is fantastic, but we will still also open up the floor if we have a few minutes to any remaining questions. Uh, Leva, thank you. It's um, um, your, uh, your turn. Perfect. So thank you again to the panelists for raising many interesting and important issues. So I'll start the moderated roundtable by asking, given the current context that we see ourselves, what should be the research priorities and or some policy solutions? Any of the panelists? Uh, should I, anyone can, <laughs> well, uh, for, uh, for us in India, I think COVID has come at a time when we were already facing a very challenging situation in terms of employment growth and particularly women's employment growth. Uh, so I would say that this, the fact that we have to do a reset button should be used creatively uh, to end a situation which was not favorable to gender equality. And if, you know, people are, uh, will, I think, be more uh, receptive to accepting policy changes at this time because it's stimulated by the crisis. But this is really the time to put the agenda of gender equality very firmly on the table. It's a good time to do that. I can um, say, I, I think that now is really a time to um, recognize how important informal workers are 
and many of those workers are women workers. Um, and actually for people to, and for governments to, to, to start understanding um, that in, informality often underpins labor markets and the economy in many countries and workers need to be given the respect and the space um, to help develop policy solutions together with governments um, that can support them. I do think a policy sort of idea that I think is really important is that many, many of the res policy responses we're seeing to support the informal economy specifically now, or workers in the informal economy now, tend to be unidimensional policy responses, right? Um, and not only short term, but generally focusing either on a, you know, a cash grant um, and there are other responses, but a lot of the, res the sort of sectoral economic support responses have focused on supporting large businesses in the, in, in the formal economy. That kind of granular detailed support is, is not what we we're seeing in the informal economy. Um, so I think there's a need to move beyond these sort of more unidimensional policy responses to multidimensional responses, which really consider the intersecting sources of disadvantage for women in the informal economy, because COVID is, is working through those sources of disadvantage at the same time. Um, one of them is social protection, absolutely. Another is livelihood recovery and regeneration. And there I think it's particularly important to understand that there are different sectors in the informal economy and that different groups of workers are going to need different types of support. You know, if we think about domestic workers, um, the support might be about, well, how do we build a care economy um, that, that sees domestic workers as care workers? Because quite often domestic workers don't get seen as care workers. Um, so that's potentially one way that we start rebuilding livelihoods in, the, in that sector. Um, for street vendors, it might be a combination of removing um, negative uh, sort of urban policies that impact on vendors' ability to operate in urban space and perhaps livelihood restarter grants um, so that people can, can get their businesses going again. Uh, for people working, you know, for home workers in supply chains, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of work to be done around the rebuilding of those supply chains on a fairer basis. So, so that livelihood regeneration aspect really needs to take into account the diversity. I think a third part of this holistic package is access to social services and not just seeing those as wasteful public expenditure, but seeing them as part of income and livelihood regeneration, access to childcare, access to healthcare, particularly for women uh, workers in the informal economy. That's not just going to be about the social side of life. That's really about giving them the opportunity to regenerate their incomes. Um, and we've all seen how much not having childcare uh, impacts on people's ability to work. And it's the same for informal workers. And I think a fourth one is around urban policies and regulations, access to sanitation, access to water, um, and so on, which we've also seen the effects of people not having, having these things. And particularly if we are continuing and the virus is still out there and we are still wanting people to work, um, those basics of hygiene uh, need to be in place in both informal workplaces and, and in informal settlements. I agree completely. I think that when we're looking at policies, it's, it's very easy to see the informal sector as a, a heterogeneous group. And so when, we're, when governments are creating policies, they definitely need to target policies to specific um, informal sectors. Do any of the other panelists have any add-on comments before we move to the Q&A? Um, uh, yeah, uh, um, I, I agree with this uh, main issue of informal sector, but um, uh, of course, in terms of social protection, which has been clearly a major issue uh, evidenced by the crisis, the crisis but also, um, I agree with this heterogeneous view, and 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 the issue is not only to 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 try to make informal formal uh, procedures, but also look at the barriers. Why are they informal? In the case of women, in, in most cases, is is because they they need to they cannot afford to work full full time in an office, or, and 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 they need to to take their children or or work part time. So uh, and and other 
barriers that are behind why, why they want they are formal or it's not only the cost of, of paying for formality but what it implies to be formal too. So it's a complex issue that needs to be addressed and this is a, an opportunity to, to do it. I think it's high time we started learning from the non-neoliberal labor markets. It's high time we learned why do they survive, how they have survived, what institutions do they use, and how can these institutions be replaced, help us restructure neoliberal capitalism. We have been making women add-ons to neoliberal capitalism by putting them in microfinance, by giving them credit, by giving them trade. But they are just add-ons. We need a revolution. <coughs> and this revolution can only be realized if we learn from the informal sector, if we learn from the non-neoliberal labor markets. How come they have survived in the 21st century? During the structural adjustment crisis of the 1980s, the informal sector became entrenched in Kenya. Why? Because of it, it had its own dynamic systems. So we need to learn, and the, 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 the policy should learn how this system operates. Are they community economies? Are they alternative to capitalism? Or what are they? Great, I'm gonna open it up to, um, to two short questions. So the first one that we have from our attendees is looking at the, in terms of resilience strategy, have, have you seen research on ICT supporting um, the coping strategy in the informal sector to reduce gender gaps? So for example, E-Trade. And um, have we seen or considered the impact on girls and child labor during um, currently and in the, what would it look like in the post-COVID world? Laura, it's the informal sector. You should uh, answer, I guess. I'm afraid this is beyond my sort of um, area of work. <laughs> so I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that. That's going to be useful at all. Um, I think it's possible that the uh, um, whoever was asking these questions has just given us some new research priorities that we should look into. <laughs> Did anybody uh, else want to say anything uh, um, this question? I I haven't done a, I haven't really looked at the, at the effects on, on girls and, and um, labor uh, for children. But um, one issue, one one um, further issue that we may expect is that since in a, in, in developing countries in a poor context, children are gonna be not really uh, are gonna and it's going to be difficult for them to benefit from distance education. They may be further um, uh, disappointed with the education system and this uh, in, in context of families uh, facing income restrictions and, and uh, may result in, in, in more dropouts. So we may, we may expect a lot of dropouts in, in, in schools besides the effects on, on and the widening gaps in access to quality education and, and human capital. But this, this is also something that should be considered when, when we do research and to try to help with coping mechanisms. I think um, ICT can contribute to the informal economy in many ways. For example, we need technologies that will make work easier in the informal sector. For example, sometimes I wonder in my home in central Kenya, if there was something like a lawnmower, which women could use to till land, 
how much more would food security be? Instead of just making apps, what don't we do micro technologies that will help make work easier? Instead of digging with a hole, a woman will have something like a lawn mower where she will till the land with it. The other thing is that when we are making apps, can we be more democratic, not make apps for extracting the informal economy? If you make an app that will be extracting the informal economy, you are sure it will not work like the cashless pay in the transport industry. So there is a lot that um, ICT could do, but it should be more democratic and also think of micro technologies that can be used in, 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 in peasant activities, in cleaning fish, in all these kind of things. There's a lot that in form of technologies that can be done. Um, great. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. Um, and it's, it's really too bad because um, this has been a really fantastic panel. And, and uh, I know I would have liked to uh, have a chance to have a, a longer, deeper conversation on these issues. Um, I, there's been really a lot of um, very interesting information, but also a lot of food for thought, a lot of very interesting um, policy uh, ideas, uh, but also a lot of research uh, priorities. And so I think this has been uh, certainly, um, you know, very much um, what I was I was hoping to get uh, out of the seminar. So thank you. I'd like to thank uh, very much our four panelists uh, for their interventions and their insights. Um, and uh, just uh, before I, I, uh, we end the, the webinar, of course, we will be um, posting the webinar on the Women's Empowerment Lab. Um, do give us a little bit of time. We do need to do some editing uh, for them to get out. But, uh, you know, if you uh, follow us uh, on Twitter, we will certainly be, um, you know, making an announcement there when they're available. And this is, of course, the first seminar of a series. We're hoping to do a few more between now and the end of August. Um, so stay tuned for a seminar on the care economy, for a seminar on marriage and fertility, gender-based violence. We are going to look at um, the long-term effects on, on girls' education as well, um, social protection, and more. Um, so with that, uh, just a, a round of virtual applause for the, uh, for the uh, panelists, uh, for the attendees who have been uh, participating from uh, uh, pretty much around the world. And um, thank you all, and hopefully see you soon.